All right, here we are for Breaking Changes, episode two. And I have my friend, uh, James Higginbotham with us. So James, to kind of set the stage for the, what we're gonna be talking about this week, he is uh, the enterprise grade, uh, not source of knowledge when it comes to APIs, the API lifecycle that I always turn to and I've uh, many of my customers and clients over the years have turned to. And so uh, with that said, um, welcome James to Breaking Changes. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ken. I'm excited to be here. So you're an independent professional. So last week we talked with Shutterstock. I wanted to kind of shift it up because I find you have a very valuable lens on the space that I think our customers uh, need to hear from. And, and you provide some, some interesting view on on the problems that that most of our enterprise customers face. So you're an independent professional. Um, why why remain independent? I mean, why why not join you know an Accenture or big big agency or other firm? Why why do you do this on your own? Uh, well, you know, there's a few reasons. One, my my career path has led me down this uh, down this trajectory where I've spent time in software architecture and product thinking. And this intersection with APIs is a, is a great blend between those. Um, the other is that when I first started out, there were not a lot of organizations that had API-specific practices. I've been consulting for years. Uh, I know what it's like to be a consultant in a larger organization. And, uh, you know, you really need the support system of that organization to be able to make a really good go of it. Uh, so there wasn't really anything out there. I jumped out on my own and, you know, I've just been having a blast ever since. Nice. So how, how do customers hear about you? How do you, how do you find new customers? What's the general way they, they find your way? Uh, a lot of times our organizations that we previously engaged with, uh, as they the executives or director levels typically will start talking with others in the industry and we'll get a referral from there or from the API community. So uh, those like yourself and others that are heavily involved in the API community, whether they're Full time at an organization in 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 that capacity, or if they're like me and they're consulting independently, uh, every once in a while we'll get a contact form on the website where someone will just find us organically when they're looking around for some information. Uh, but most of the time, it's through referrals uh, and it keeps us pretty busy. Yeah, I definitely have have uh, sent a few folks your way that that I know needs your help. Um, so, what when it comes to what you do, is it is it more technical or is it more business? Uh, it's a blend of both, really. Uh, I come from a technical background. I've been a software developer, software architect, uh, and in a consulting capacity. So I've worked with a variety of different uh, verticals over, over my career. Uh, but, but a lot of times what I'm involved with is a blend of the two. I need to be able to sit down with executives from the CIO uh, to the CTO and understand kind of where they're at uh, when I'm first starting an engagement or we're in the uh, sales process. And, and then we, we work with their, their offices to help deliver the services and deliver the API program. So it takes a blend of both. Understanding both what it means to deliver an API program from a business perspective, what are the metrics, what are the key goals from the business side of things, as well as the technical side, helping to advise on processes, standards, patterns, those kinds of elements as well, and working with those that are in the trenches delivering APIs to help them start thinking about their APIs in, in new and uh, in innovative ways. So when, in one of your usual engagements, I mean, what does a customer walk away from when, in, when after working with you? Uh, a lot of times, uh, organizations we work with, they already have an API program in place. It may be formalized or it may not be formalized as of yet, but they're producing APIs. And they're seeing an opportunity in one way or another. Either they're wanting a little bit more formality around their program and their processes, or maybe they have some of that. They're looking to mature and grow it or scale it across the organization. So when they're done, you know, when we're done working with uh, with our customers, they're going to come away with a few things. One is that they're going to shift their mindset from more of a data-driven or app-driven API perspective, and they're going to start thinking more about outcome-driven APIs. What are the users and the developers trying to achieve? What are they trying to, what kind of result are they trying to produce? Uh, that's the big one. The other thing we're going to look for is and, and try to instill in these organizations is a sense of API ownership. 
many of the organizations we work with, they will treat an API like they treat any other initiative in the organization. It gets funded as a project. It has a life cycle. It has a natural end date. And then the API is just going to sit out there and they're not improved and matured. And we want to make that shift for them uh, so that they have uh, more of an appreciation for owning that API and growing it over time like any other product, whether they're a SaaS or whether they're just delivering APIs for their partners and workforce. Uh, the last thing is just an appreciation for great API documentation. Um, that's a discipline that's really lacking and we try to instill a sense of, of, of uh, making sure that we have great documentation for the APIs that we deliver and making sure that we have the technical writers in place to help support them so the developers don't feel like they're left on their own. That way we can ensure that these APIs deliver, deliver a great developer experience. Yeah, I think you've all, I've always felt like you help customers realize that this is a journey and this is an ongoing thing. That's why I always felt like put it, you know, sending people your way was always a good thing because they most of the people I was talking to just didn't quite realize that this is an ongoing thing that it wasn't just something they're going to be done with. And I the the type of attention that that you give, I think really helps them in that journey and realize and equips them for the long haul and not just, you know, the, the, the quick fix or some of the more trendier things that, or advice people give in the space. Um, but, you know, I've known you for quite a few years now. And one of the things I really like talking with you about is the history of APIs. You're one of those people, um, I don't want to call us old timers, but we've been in the space for a while. You've been in the space for a while. So I, I, I want to, I want, you know, my audience to hear, a little bit about you know that history and your view of how we got here. So when did you see, first see the potential of APIs? Uh, well, you know, as if we really go back a while, I, I got introduced to distributed computing and some of those ideas, um, you know, in the probably in the late '90s when we started seeing network computing really take off. Uh, we had had mainframes before. I wasn't really as involved during that time frame, but just seeing even just from the Java perspective, the need to be able to push data around the network and access systems across the network and really start to see what became more of a cloud architecture that we have today. It was just kind of the, the, the seeds of that then. Uh, but, but really it was probably about um, a decade ago where I really started seeing uh, this vision of what network APIs could become. And I was heavily involved in service oriented architecture and. So uh, SOAP, uh, I'd done Corbo before that, a lot of different technologies. And as you said earlier, these technologies change, but the principles stay the same. So as we started seeing a lot of these mobile devices come out, that's when we st I really started to see how APIs are really becoming first class, not just a technical solution, but really a blend of business product and tech. And that's what really got me excited about it. But my history goes back quite a ways now. And it's, it's been useful because we, sometimes we see the same patterns repeating over and over again. Uh, sometimes the same principles apply today that applied in the 90s. Um, and then sometimes we have to make adjustments. We have to learn from our mistakes. So I, I really like to instill a sense of history whenever I teach and take people through training. We don't dwell on it a lot, but just kind of stepping back a little bit and asking ourselves, how did we get here and why? What can we learn from that is really, really important because it helps us kind of move forward in a more productive and innovative fashion. We don't repeat the same mistakes, but we learn from a move on and we can try different things along the way. So very important because it's definitely one of the reasons I started telling people to tune into your work is I was getting those questions. How did we just do this? I mean, so this is 2012, <laughs> 2013, and I mm -hmm. think people have just kind of recovered from SOA investment, you know, into service oriented architecture. And this API trend came along and they would ask, didn't we just do this? What's what's different? And I didn't always have the right answer. So I always felt like you were a source of information that I could send folks to yeah. uh, to help yeah. out with that. I appreciate that. Yeah, for, for me, I think it was really eye-opening when I start to, started to see APIs productized. And we have the classic Twilio's and the other examples. But I think for me, the big aha moment was when I was working with Heroku, uh, you know, as a platform, as a service, when they first started coming out, and I, at the time, was consulting to a number of startups uh, it, during that season. It was more about startups and enterprises for, for a moment in time. And they were using Heroku to deploy out. And Heroku has always had this marketplace 
where you could add install add-ons into your application. So, you know, for those that may not be familiar with Heroku, you take your code base and you do a you provision a project on on their infrastructure and you just do a git push of the code and it would auto detect what language, what framework, how things should be set up. It just configures it and deploys it and you don't have to worry about it. And it's kind of the ultimate idea of I can write code and get it deployed and not worry about standing up infrastructure. And uh, it was really popular for startups and, and you start deploying your product and all of a sudden you go, oh, I can add in a database and you flip a switch or run a command line and the database is enabled. And then you say, well, I want to email, what can I use? And at that time it was SynGrid was kind of the one that was really leading in the, in the Heroku marketplace. And you, you start to realize, oh, I'm really using APIs to send emails. I don't have to write SMTP clients and submit data that way, although I could send emails that way. I could also use different kinds of APIs that they offered, and I can enable that API really quick with their marketplace. And it sort of gave me the big aha moment that this is much bigger than the SOA world, much bigger than all the technologies we had before, because we had we had the SaaS uh, solutions out, and now the SaaS solutions were starting to create marketplaces, and the power just started to really, you know, exponentially grow for a developer and what they could do and how they could pull things together. Uh, quickly and easily. And that really led me to the current incarnation of APIs and really get excited about it. Because we're not just sitting down and training people how to use a particular technology. You know, here's how you do your SOAP service and so on and so forth. It was really about how do we turn this thing into something that's meaningful for the organization, whether it's a product, whether it's just running revenue through it, whether it's enabling our workforce to be more efficient, whatever it is, it was a lot more powerful than it was before. And the story was starting to really mature. And that really got me excited. It was fun times. Yeah, and I think that public aspect is why I find a lot of people are waking up is they're using more SaaS services. They're using more mm -hmm. cloud services, as well as that core internal infrastructure that's, I think, so represented. But I think it's it's a much it's a it's a different world than it was earlier uh, on when SOA was was taking root. So, so for these organizations, these enterprise organizations that, I, that we're talking to, everyone's waking up to the fact that they need APIs, um, but they're using an increased amount of third party ones. Where do they start? What's the first thing an enterprise organization can do that's the most going to have the most meaningful impact when it comes to doing APIs? Uh, the starting point can vary from org to org, but really what I like to do is sit down and try to help them establish a center for enablement or C4E. Um, it, it creates consistency and it creates a program where we coach teams and support teams that are building APIs. One of the most often things that we encounter is that teams themselves, uh, when left on their own, they'll figure out how to build an API, but how to be effective at it is something completely different. So being able to spend a little time with the organization to help them formalize their program and grow it is, is really important. Uh, now, the C4E is, is made up of a lot of different elements. We'll probably get into it as we, as we talk throughout, throughout this discussion. Uh, and it has challenges. But really, more than anything else, the goal of the C4E is to deliver uh, a group of dedicated experts that can support the teams in the organization. Uh, it's a much different than the old SOA governance days where we had these kind of ivory tower situations where everyone controlled everything. Uh, it's more about having experts that understand how to design APIs and, and capture patterns and create consistency in the developer experience. That's what you really need. And so that center for enablement is a great place to start. It will have the biggest impact because it's going to help teams be more effective and give them the support that they need. When they have a question, they have a place to go to. When they're not sure what kind of decisions to make, if, they've, if they have multiple choices, they know where to go. Uh, if they're just kind of feeling a little uncertain about what they're going to release, uh, th that Center for Enablement's there to, to help support it. And they do it through a number of you know, different disciplines and standards, practices, patterns, and so on. Uh, but, but that's where we like to start. And, and that sets the stage for everything else. Because they're the ones that are going to be front line. Yeah. Is this something that would you say is is a bottom up movement or is it something that should be done from top down or is it a mix of both? Uh, I do see organizations try to start kind of from the bottom up and get their API program going. And they can usually get it to a certain point, but it really does require buy in from the top down. So you need your executives to be able to fund this for longevity. Uh, of the program. If you don't have the funding, 
uh, it will always get deprioritized in favor of something else. If you have the executives on board, you're going to be able to move forward effectively. Uh, so you can start it as maybe a skunk works project or maybe just one team says, here's some lessons we learned and you throw it out on a wiki or something internally and share that with other teams. And I've seen that be effective to a point. And that is usually a nice incubator for the C4E if you don't have executive buy-in, but there will be a point where you're going to have to have that buy-in. The organizations that have it flourish with their API programs. The ones that don't really struggle. And the ones that don't have executive buy-in have, str have struggles bringing us in as consultants because they, they can't legitimize the spend necessary and the effort necessary to get all those elements in place so that they can multiply their effectiveness out to the edges of the organization, to all the teams that are executing, unless they have that, that executive leadership. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it, it reflects what I'm, a lot of the conversations I'm having with organizations is most leadership waking up to the fact that they need to have, they need to get a handle on the APIs. And I would say the number one reason that leadership's waking up and, and asking for when it comes to APIs is, is API governance. And it's something that isn't always positively seen from a bottom up, but from a top down, they want more API governance, more governance across operations. So for leadership watching this show, what is API governance? Uh, sure, yeah, API governance, it does definitely come with a negative connotation sometimes, particularly those, those were, that were around during the SOA days and they established a SOA governance board. Uh, that, that oftentimes brings you back to the days when everything was very centralized. There's a small group of people making a lot of approval decisions for the entire organization. Um, today, API governance looks a lot different, at least in our perspective. Uh, the, the C4E that I mentioned earlier is a great start. It's a group of people that are experts. And part of what they're going to do is they're not going to dictate down from on high, thou shall do this and thou shall not do that. Um, they really instead want to build a series of guide rails to help, or, to help teams, help the whole organization be efficient and effective at using APIs. So we want to give them the room to allow the teams to, to develop that API the way they need it to. But we also want to recognize that there are some better ways to create consistency across APIs. Some organizations have been producing APIs for years, and if you go look at one API, it'll look completely different than another API in an organization that was designed relatively in the same time frame, not even allowing calendar time to tick away, but just two teams building two APIs in parallel for two different purposes, they'll look completely different. It won't even look like it's from the same organization. And uh, sometimes that's okay when we're targeting different audiences, different market segments. They may need different things. But oftentimes we want to allow our developers that are gonna be using our APIs, whether they're internal partners or customers, to use them in a consistent way. So when they start blending those APIs together to do new and interesting things, they're not relearning a whole new way of doing something. So in that case, API governance is really meant to make all of that a reality. And, and we do that uh, in, in, our, in our world, in the, launch, the, the world of Launch Any, we do that through the API strategy compass. When we engage organizations, we help them understand there's really eight core disciplines that you really need to have. And when you have those eight disciplines to some extent along the way, then you're gonna have more consistency and a better developer experience, more re re reuse internally, and um, more opportunities to capitalize on market shifts as they occur, uh, and you can respond to them quicker. So, so a lot of that compass, it, it's driven by, just imagine an eight point compass. We, we start on the true north uh, with strategy and culture. Is your strategy clear? Do you know why you have an API? And, and is it driving growth for the, the business in some way? And, and then we start working away clockwise around the compass. So we look at process and governance. Uh, so we do have a little bit of governance in that you may want to have a bit of consistency style guides and things that can be enforced with, with tools or other means. Uh, and, and so you want that in there, but you want it to be lightweight. You just want guardrails, like we said, just, just something that keeps people kind of headed in the same direction so that we don't have APIs scattered with all sorts of different things, but, but nothing too complex or, or over, um, you know, uh, overexerting or, or overreaching, I guess I should say. Um, 
we also look at the portfolio. What, what kind of portfolio and products are you designing? What are your digital capabilities that you're producing? The APIs, the events, the streams, those things that represent what your business does, your business capabilities as in digital form. And how are you organizing that and how are you making sure they're aligned? Uh, we then look at uh, discovering documentation. So as a developer, how do I find the APIs? Are, is the documentation supporting that discovery and what we need to do? Um, then we look at onboarding and adoption. So are we making it easy for developers to get started? Is it low friction? How do we help developers be effective at what they're doing by using the APIs? Otherwise, the developer is going to go straight back to that database that they've always gone to and start running SQL queries, and they'll bypass the API if they're able to. So we need to make a low friction so that the incentivization uh, or the incentives are there to, to make sure that we can get those developers onboarded quickly. We look at design and delivery. How are we consistently designing our APIs and delivering them? Making sure that we have that right uh, life cycle in there. And then we look at management analytics. Are the APIs owned? Do we have metrics that we're tracking? Are they helping us move in the right direction? And then finally, all of that is wrapped up with security and operations. How do we secure the APIs so that we don't open up uh, different kinds of uh, attack vectors through our API, and then how do we make sure that the operations support you know, highly available and resilient services? So we look at all of those things and all those go into the C4E, they go into that process, they fit into that API governance, and that helps make a healthy ecosystem. And you can start small and you can work your way up. You don't have to do all of that at once, but it's really important. So you can see where that Center for Excellence and having those experts and that support for those teams that are delivering is really important. If not, every team's gotta go through this checklist. But if you have that, that, that C4E group and API coaches that can jump in with the API teams and help them deliver effectively, it makes a huge difference because now they're supported. Now they can focus on what they need to deliver. They don't have to reinvent everything from scratch. And we have more consistency in the way that we manage those APIs inside the organization and how we offer them you know, outward to our partners and our customers. Well, it's a much more holistic view of the landscape than I would say if you Google governance, API governance, a lot of you get is a very narrow focus on design mm -hmm. um, and, and, and maybe validating that design and getting consistent design. But you have a much more holistic, I mean, the strategy and culture, the process and governance, you know, applying it to the products and the portfolio that, that, that's in place. But I would say the most visible aspect of the API lifecycle, I find, which is kind of what people point to as, as one of the number one pain points is, is documentation, just specifically. It's kind of the poster child for what's wrong with APIs or, or what's deficient. Why do enterprise organizations struggle so much with documentation? Yeah, this, this is, you're going to get me on my soapbox a little bit here, Ken, because this, mm -hmm. this frustrates me as well. Uh, if, if you're a developer that's listening to this, you probably have experienced a really bad API whether it's a web API, whether it's just a, a library for your programming like you're trying to use, and you have to dig into the code to figure out what's going on, it gets really frustrating. If you're an executive, if you're a leader, you probably have encountered situations where the project's behind and you can't figure out why, and it's because we thought that a particular API could do something. Uh, we made some assumptions about it. The documentation maybe was a little thin or a little vague, and we're not really sure. We couldn't try the API out soon enough to kind of vet and mitigate those risks that were there. And so here we are now trying to, to, to deal with that real time when we're trying to execute and it can be difficult. But I personally, from my soapbox perspective, I think our software industry has really failed with documentation. I think we fail with documentation as considering as part of being done with software. We, we've either assumed that the developer is gonna be around forever and we're not gonna lose that knowledge of how the software works. Or we've confused code and documentation. Sometimes we, we encounter people that uh, mistakenly confuse code is documentation. And while code can tell us what the, the code, the, the execution path is or what the intention is, it doesn't tell us why. The code never tells us why it was built unless we have documentation. So at the simplest level of code, without even talking about web APIs, we failed. We failed because we've allowed the code is documentation to win in some organizations and it creates problems. Um, I was always taught you write the docs before the write, writing the code. And I think it was Steve McConnell from his Microsoft press book line. Uh, maybe it was a pragmatic programmers 
or maybe it was both of them, kind of talked about how to write the documentation for a function or a method before you actually write the code. Make sure your logic is sound. Make sure you explain why you're having to do this, what the purpose of it is, not just at the method level, but internally as well, because the next developer, even if it's you six months later, won't know what's going on and you'll need that. You'll want to lean on that. And if you can document it, then you can write the code. But if you can't document it, then it's going to be a little bit harder to express both the intent and the reasoning for the code and get the code right uh, the, way, the way that you want it. So this leads to confusion, poor documentation, makes it harder on developers just working on a single code base. Now, if we extract that out and we look at our web API surface areas that we're offering, then the documentation or poor documentation or lack of documentation just amplifies because now we're not targeting a specific small set of developers that have to work with some code, a small little part of, a, of an overall code base. We're talking about tens to hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of developers that are gonna be trying to use a particular API and they're not gonna know how to do it. And so they're either gonna walk away or they're gonna just completely pound the developers with questions and those developers are gonna be overwhelmed and unable to support that API at scale. So, we have to think about a few things. One, our web APIs, we're never gonna be able to see the source code. If you're internal to the organization and you're using another internal API, maybe you have access to the source code by virtue of your single sign in with your org, but you may not even know what repo to look in. Uh, but most organizations, they're not gonna release their source code externally. Twitter's not gonna share their source code for their API so that you can dig in and understand what it means to use it, neither is, Slack, neither is, is uh, you know, Stripe or any of these other organizations. So you're not going to have the source code. So we have to focus on great documentation. And that documentation has to meet developers where they're at, whether they're a new developer and they don't understand pa certain patterns and practices, or they're the expert and they just want to dive in and they have to meet that uh, exactly where they're at. So if, if we get code as docs wrong, then our API docs are going to suffer as well. If we get the idea that documentation is part of being done, not just the code, not just the test, then we're not gonna struggle as much. Then we're gonna deliver a great experience for the developers and the result is gonna be more effective de developers that are able to use APIs quickly and, and easily and get things done. And that's really where we want these programs to be at, not struggling to even figure out how to use one API. Um, organizations I work with that don't have this documentation down, this effort down, maybe they don't have internal tech writers that, that can kind of help craft that documentation a bit, coach developers on being better at it, or kind of filling in the gaps from developers, you know, taking that handoff and, and taking that extra mile. If they don't have that, then most of the time they either have multiple copies of the same API, which is unnecessary, or no one's really using the APIs at all. And they're just duplicating data, replicating it to another database and running SQL queries. Uh, and they're not leveraging the opportunities that APIs bring forth. Yeah, so important. I mean, just forcing folks to get out of their their current mindset and think with that external focus. And I think a lot of people are all already on this journey in a lot of organizations. We see a lot of API first, kind of design first movements. But folks who are trying to move this needle forward, there's a lot of entrenched folks who are who believe in code first. Code is how you do it. That's what they are. They're, they're developers. They've been writing code for years. And so what sort of advice do you recommend for getting these code first folks to think more externally and think about the, the design of the APIs that will lead to these better outcomes? Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a challenge. It's why our northern uh, compass point is strategy and culture, because it requires buy-in from the organization to accept that uh, the, the role of the developers changing. I, I hear the term all the time, shift left. Shift left, shift everything left, shift security left, shift uh, automation of, of test automation left, shift API design left. And pretty soon if we shift everything left, there's nothing on the right left. The poor developers are getting just overwhelmed with things to do. So you do have to shift the culture and you have to say, it's okay to take an extra beat and slow down and think about the design. Uh, it might mean that the organizations need to rethink how they approach their API design and to make sure that you have that C4E there where people can raise their hand and say, need a little help. You know, I, I've, I've heard it time and again, API first, this is what we're supposed to be doing. 
don't know what that means to me. I'm a developer. I've got a year and a half worth of experience out of university. How do I, you know, how do I move forward? How do I do this? I, I'm not a, an architectural thinker. How do I figure out how to design an API? So first and foremost, there's nothing wrong with code first if you're using that to explore the problem space. Uh, but at some point, you have to step back and really kind of reassess what you're trying to do and take an outside-in perspective. And sometimes that requires having API coaches, API architects that are kind of working with the team shoulder to shoulder and helping them kind of surface and get through those design issues and help them think more about design and make that more of a first class process. Uh, we do that uh, at Launch Any through trying to teach organizations how to think about outcome-based API design. And we make it really easy. We use a process we call align, define, design. We align first on understanding what we need to build. There is nothing more frustrating as a developer, and I've experienced this, and I'm sure those of those of you that are listening and watching now that are developers or have done development in the past have struggled with that as well. There is nothing more frustrating than writing code that never makes it into production, that gets thrown away, that gets abandoned, or that gets torn apart at the last minute because we completely misunderstood what was needed, and now we're under the gun to deliver what's actually needed. And that was the intent of Agile, to have com constant uh, communication channels between the, the business, the customers, and the developers so that we're all kind of aligned. And we, we've somehow forgotten that with some of the Agile methodologies we have out there. Or we've delegated that to product owners and product managers, but we don't incorporate them into the API design. It's often seen, APIs are often seen as a technical concern. But it's not like we're choosing whether we're going to use Node or Java and Spring Boot or, or something else completely. It's really more about how do we blend our business and our technology together. And that's where the align phase is. We all come together and understand a little bit more about what we're trying to do, what the outcomes are. Uh, we allow the voice of the customer to, to bubble up. And this becomes more of a product ownership, product thinking mentality than we've had traditionally in, in IT uh, or in, in software product development of any kind. Uh, so, so that aligning is essential. It gets everybody on the same page. Then once we have that, then we teach people to take that, those, those artifacts and those things that come out of it, job stories or user stories and other elements, event storming and other kinds of things we do during the align phase, and turn those into high-level API profiles. That's the define phase. We define what the APIs are and what operations they need to deliver, but we do it in a protocol agnostic way. We don't get specific about what it needs to look like. We then, once we define what the API needs to look like, we can go into the design phase. And these are all kind of rapid fire. They can happen over hours or days, depending on kind of the scope of the effort. But we, we then go into the design phase and we say, do we want to use a REST-based style? Do we want to use GraphQL? Do we want to use gRPC? What makes the most sense? And then we design that API to meet that need. And we might actually design that API multiple ways. We might deliver a REST-based API and a GraphQL because our target audience is maybe split on which one they prefer. So we need to deliver both. Both. So we may deliver one first to meet the needs of a particular audience and then follow it up with a the same API definition realized as a new design with a new protocol, uh, maybe gRPC, GraphQL, whatever it is. And then we extend that further. Once we have the design, we, we can go into the delivery phase and that's where everybody can parallelize out. Uh, we can parallelize out the, the work. We can build the API, we can build automated tests, we can document it, we can build mocks for it, we can, you know, we can go through all those different elements and we can do it in parallel so that the API is now not a blocker. We've all come together, we've aligned and defined and designed, and now we can go off and do the work that needs to be done to deliver it and to manage it once into production and to own it. And we repeat that frequently, we iterate that frequently uh, as we learn more, need to expand the capabilities of the API and do more and more work. And along the way, we're checking in with our customers. We're, we have artifacts we can share with them. You don't want to share your code generally, so starting code first doesn't give you anything to share, but having a design helps everybody come to the table, bring their skills, their insights, their domain expertise together to solve the problem at hand, make sure we're all aligned on the same thing, define the API, design it, and then we can share that artifact, usually an API, uh, like an open API specification format or API blueprint or something else. So it really makes a huge difference. Um, we, in fact, I've documented this in an upcoming book that I'm releasing from Addison Wesley. It's called Principles of Web API Design. 
Uh, I think there's pre-order on Amazon on, and, and on the Addison Wesley um, Inform IT website and some of the others uh, where I walk you through that step by step so that individuals or teams can understand how to do that. But we actually train on how to do that at scale for organizations. We'll train small amounts of teams and then we'll scale that out. And it makes a huge difference in how teams approach their API designs. It helps them go code first when they need to, to explore a problem, to de-risk something, to figure out what's possible. And then we can step back and we can take that outcome-based approach. And we have confidence that our API design is, is gonna be meeting the needs of our customers, not just our own internal needs to get data out of a database and send it across the wire. Yeah, that, I mean, wow, that's so much more holistic than I think people think about, you know, the design needs within an uh, enterprise operations. It's much more aligned to the business needs, the goals. It focuses on the humans. Um, it's it's not the, the, I think, a lot of the classic API design as part of governance conversations I'm seeing. So, I mean, wow, that's definitely something as far as how organizations can move forward, can, can think differently about their operations. But what, when you get that in motion, I mean, it's gonna take understanding and kind of dialing, dialing it in. So what are some meaningful metrics that, that teams can tune into when it comes to their operations to understand whether they're succeeding or failing in, uh, once they have this in motion? Uh, yeah, metrics are a challenging thing. I, I like to get organizations to start off by saying, what, what is success for this API? Is it the number of queries sent to it? Is a particular transaction or outcome, maybe multiple steps? You know, so for like an e-commerce example, if we're shopping, um, adding things to a cart is nice. It gives us some insights, but the sale is really the big, you know, completing that transaction. Is, is sort of the, the desired outcome. So do we have a way to track and determine what our conversion rate is? It's a lot like managing a website uh, in that you, know, you have that funnel and, and you're gonna have people coming through the funnel that just happen to be using an API instead. And then eventually you're gonna come out and they're gonna hit a particular transaction or key metric. That's the first thing. What is it that this API does that we wanna track? The number of something, number of successful transactions, number of queries, number of, whatever it is, that's the first metric. The other one to look at sometimes is number of consumers. Uh, are we seeing growth in the API? Are we seeing adoption? That's not always a great metric and it might need to shift a little bit. Maybe the transactions or the, the successful outcomes, maybe that's the primary metric you drive on. It could be number of consumers if you're building kind of a shared API, particularly within an organization, but, but even outside of it. And then looking at things like the response codes, you know, are we having, error messages sent back to the API? Is it because there's some sort of UX issue, the form is not understandable, so they're filling out bad data and the API is giving back an error message and the user's having to correct it, can we optimize that path? So there's some secondary ones like that where we're looking for, for uh, you know, 400 style error messages where there's some kind of problem going on underneath instead of the 200s. And then the error messages where the servers have failed, like the 500. Is there instability in the code or infrastructure we need to improve? Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I thought was a really interesting story was uh, we had one client who was using, a, a, had offered an internal API. They had another team starting to consume it. They were doing it in kind of a, a staged fashion where they were kind of in a staging environment or kind of a pre-production environment. They were using the API and everything was fine. They rolled out the code, the app into production that was using that API. And all of a sudden they started tracking usage of an API and they started seeing a spike in the number of requests per second for a particular API. And they narrowed it down to the API key for that team. And they looked and they figured out that the team was not using cache control to save themselves hitting the API. And so every time they needed a piece of data, they weren't keeping it close at hand they would use it and then throw it away. And what was happening is they were actually doing that inside of a loop. So inside of a for loop, they were making a bunch of API calls unnecessarily for sometimes the same amount of data. So having some metrics that both determine your outcome and also determine how people are using your API will go a long way. And it doesn't have to be a lot of them. It just has to be the right ones. And sometimes I can take experimentation. But, uh, but also looking at, you know, APIs that maybe were built and put into a catalog and were only used by one consumer and ended up being kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. 
and asking ourselves, what are those APIs that have no consumers? It was built and no one ever used it or is built and just one team's using it. How can we improve that reuse? And that sometimes takes a little time uh, to finesse, but having metrics like that to identify those things that we've built and we have infrastructure running for that no one's using, uh, those types of metrics are really useful as well. And they can tune the operations of your API portfolio and allow you to refocus your efforts somewhere else and refocus your infrastructure dollars somewhere else as well. So some, most of these metrics I'm hearing you're talking about are going to be found at the API management layer, which is pretty central for more, most enterprise organizations. And in your experience, is this usually a, a centralized API management, one gateway, or do you see more federated and then distributed approaches to, to API gateways in, in your experience? Uh, I, I see a combination. So I see uh, for API management, both with the API management layer tooling, as well as uh, how the governance is spread out and how that kind of reflects in the API management layer. So oftentimes what we'll see is we'll see a, a shared group that's responsible for and, and understands how to configure and secure and monitor and manage the API management layer. And that'll be a central group that, that kind of keeps things small and, and lean, but they may have multiple instances of the API management layers. And that may reflect either the way the organization is structured, kind of that Conway's law, of how things kind of emerge and every team may be needing uh, an API management layer for a particular API they're externalizing to a group of partners and they don't wanna have that partner negatively impacted by a problem from another partner. Uh, it's kind of the classic multi-tenant problem in the SaaS world as well. So we'll see some sort of centralized group that oversees the API management layer. We'll sometimes see teams prior to an organized C4E where they don't know where to go, they don't know how to find out who else is using API management layers or building APIs themselves, uh, they'll just kind of stand up their own thing and, uh, or they'll build their own inside of code. And so it takes a while to kind of figure out how to manage those because they're scattered all over the place. It creates a lot of inconsistency in the developer experience because the way that I go get an API token for one API will be different than another API inside the same organization. That can be pretty frustrating. So having some sort of centralized way of, of provisioning uh, an API management layer or gateway for your particular team or a group uh, is really important. And then over time, it usually gets distributed and, and scales out. So you might have different API gateways or management layers implemented across the organization. And, and some of the newer ones are really coming out and offering some great features where they'll allow you to have many instances, but be able to submit a, a, a specific configuration and, and say what group cluster or instances they go to. And then they'll aggregate a lot of these metrics back together so that you can get a snapshot of the entire organization as well as the teams can get snapshots of their own APIs that they own. Uh, likewise, those API management layers reflect oftentimes the governance requirements as well. Sometimes you have PCI compliance or other regulatory requirements. And so you have to segment out some number of instances to, to protect those teams and those particular assets to improve the auditability of certain systems without having to audit the entire infrastructure. You can segment it and manage it separately. And, and so there's, there's a lot to that. And that sometimes will result in having uh, different federated approaches or distributed approaches to your API management teams, your C4E. You need coaches that understand some of the regulatory requirements that a particular team has to go through and factor that into the API design. Uh, having one C4E that has to know the entire organization is very difficult. So sometimes that actually introduces some complexity, but, but um, a lot more power and scalability when it comes to the governance side of things or the C4E side of things as well. And sometimes those map one-to-one -one with how your API management layer instances are deployed. Sometimes it doesn't, it just, it varies. Well, I think that was the most nuanced uh, API management response I've heard as far as how it maps to the overall organization, rather than, oh, it's just something you need, do it. You know, it was actually decoupling the reasons why, not just, just doing it. So there's there's a lot going on there potentially. There's, there's a lot of things that are being measured, a lot of information coming out of that. What should teams think about when it comes to reporting to up, upwards to leadership to, you know, keep them informed of what's going on? What's, what's the most meaningful out of all of that? 
Yeah, I, th I think there needs to be, uh, if you can create a one pager for executives that said, what's the health of our API program? Did we have any significant outages? Do we have APIs that are that we're seeing trending upward and are being used heavily? Do we have APIs that are trending downward for some reason or experiencing uh, a high number of of uh, error rates or you know so these different elements that your executives care about? And of course, the highest level executives they sort of want the green, yellow, red, and maybe a little bit of of narrative for it. The the mid level managers they need to dig in and see the details because they may need to go back to a particular team or a part of the organization and say, hey, we're having an issue here. What's going on with the quality of the API? What's going on with the quality of the code? Why are we having more, uh, you know, a spike in errors or something else? Uh, or we're seeing more infrastructure usage here uh, because we're seeing an uptick in the API. What does that mean? Do we need to, to optimize? Do we need to, uh, you know, make, make things more effective? So rolling that up is really important. The other thing that we've seen that really works well for large organizations is viewing your API portfolio as a series of capability domains. Uh, like in the hospitality world, we might be concerned about booking of, uh, you know, making reservations, the booking process. And, and that particular area requires a, a set of knowledge that others in the organization may not have. So being able to kind of go coordinate and manage and report upward, what's the health of the booking area? What's the health of, uh, you know, the, the, the check-in process or in the e-commerce world, what's the health of the shopping process? What's the health of the adoption of our third party uh, partner APIs? You know, what's our conversion rates? Are they going up or down? All of those different elements have their own metrics apart from some of those general ones I shared earlier. And those reporting structures, both as the teams that oversee and design and manage and you know, deliver and manage all those APIs, as well as the reports that determine the health of it and, and, and allow those things to be bubbled upward are oftentimes benefited from being grouped into domain areas, capability domains. So that in turn requires a little bit more of a product perspective because now we have these different domains, these capability domains, and now we need product owners for them. And there's gonna be roadmaps for them. And they may be organized by business unit or may be organized by other types of uh, of, of organizational structures, but however you do it, being able to dig in and say, where is the problem? We need to be able to have those experts. So we see that a lot of times in enterprises will come in and there'll be like a search team and they're really good at search. Uh, and they have to be good at search across a bunch of domains, but you go to that search API or that series of search APIs and you can find what you're looking for. And then, you know, hypermedia links or other kinds of ways we can go to that specific capability, once we find that search result, we know where to go to get more details about it. Others might group it by, like I'd mentioned earlier, kind of more functional. And, and you may take something like a, a booking and you may break that down into smaller discrete units that are really good at bundling up data and sending it to partners to allow other partners to resell your vacancies in different properties for your hotels or for your airline or you know whatever it is. So there's all sorts of different ways to do it. But being able to break that apart and think about the topology of your API uh, program as a whole, and knowing that certain areas, certain APIs will use different metrics, will need different reporting structures, will need to react differently, will need different skills and, and subject matter experts is really, really important. Yeah, I mean, it all it just it keeps coming back to you know the business objectives and goals for doing this. It's not just tech for the sake of tech. So I love how all roads kind of uh, end up like that as part of your strategy. So to kind of kind of wind down our conversation here, um, I mean, some some great advice for folks to think about. But clearly, you, um, I mean, and I would say this is one of the reasons that that we're both kindred spirits in this is you really care about APIs. It's clear you you think about it a lot. So is that something you expect of others? Do you expect I, I do, folks to care about APIs as much as you do as part of yeah, this process? I, I don't expect them to care about it as much when we first start working with an organization because it's new, it's a different, it's a mind shift. But but by the end of the day, yeah, I do. I, I and, and it might be unfair of me to come into an organization and say, you know, APIs are this important and you need to dedicate teams to this and you need to have line items in your budget that handle these particular elements or you need to, you know, do different with chargebacks or whatever to be able to make sure that you have the right budget to be able to move these things forward. But what I really struggle with and what I see is, is that 
that lost potential, that unmet potential that exists in organizations. There are so many smart people, developers, uh, non-developers alike, all in a variety of different roles in these enterprises. And they're spending so much time building software. And there is potential in everything that we do to wrap that into an API that people can understand that has some nice documentation and make it available for others when the time comes to be able to use it. And not just to think about it as something that's gonna get our data over HTTP and, and basically it's just, you know, SQL over HTTP and who cares and, you know, and, and, and I'm not really thinking about it. But it, it's hard because we have to step back as developers, as product managers, product owners, directors, uh, the, the C-suite, everybody has to step back and realize that to build an API that other people can use requires us to step out of our own selves for a while and think about the needs of other people. And in the midst of the day-to-day, -day, it is hard to do that. But that's my challenge to, to teams, to organizations and to individual teams and down to the individual developer, product manager, whoever you are, whatever you're doing in your organization. Can you step out of the role that you're in and think about how you're delivering an experience to someone else and how can you make that a little bit better than it was yesterday? That's the challenge I leave with people. And that's why I really do... I'm passionate about APIs. You can probably tell it from this interview. It, it's because it blends business and, and product and tech all together. It's really exciting, but it's an individual that you're impacting sometimes as not just an organization. It's an individual's day-to-day -day experience. You're going to give them a good day or you're going to give them a really rough week where they're trying to power through something that's really difficult to use. So I, I challenge organizations and individuals. How can you make that API just a little bit better? Um, and that goes back to that compass. It goes back to that north, that north point. Are we infecting our culture with a desire to do that? Or are we still incentivizing our teams to deliver fast, but not to deliver well? And, and that's the challenge I leave with a lot of organizations. Yeah, so powerful. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm very passionate about APIs. I've been doing this alongside you for a number of years. And I've seen the difference someone who raises that bar to that level can make within an organization, change the tone, change the direction, uh, energize and motivate other folks. And I think that that goes a long ways. And, and whether you do that externally coming in as a consultant or you do that as an internal champion or, or leader, I think there's a lot of opportunities for folks to step up to the plate. So someone looking to get into this, um, you know, maybe make a, a role change within the enterprise or maybe uh, become an independent similar to you eventually? What sort of advice do you got for them, James? Uh, I would say, first off, learn as much as you can about uh, HTTP, the language of the web. Um, there's a lot of power in there. And we do a lot of, I see a lot of organizations finding some amazing and very creative ways to not, uh, use HTTP to its fullest extent. Um, the other is to study software design, uh, be a student of software design and of products. Go beyond what's currently trending. Yeah, there's always trending stuff. You'll find more articles about that. Go back in history a little bit, read a little bit about, uh, you know, just general software techniques, um, design patterns and other things, and kind of dig in a little bit and understand a bit more about what came before. Uh, where you're at today, whether you're, you know, a recent grad, you're still in school, or you've been in this industry for, you know, a decade, several decades, whatever it is. Um, don't always give in to the new shiny. Uh, weigh it in, in, in light of contextually what's the right fit that will make somebody's life better. Um, let's work together. And as an industry, I think we've done a really poor job of, of creating a culture that helps to kind of, um, you know, build uh, appreciation for what's come before us instead of chasing that new thing. Uh, most of the stuff that I see today has been around for a while. And when I was starting out in the 90s, the stuff that was around then was the same stuff that a lot of people had seen before me when I was learning from them. So I, I think it's important to kind of step back, weigh those things, um, thinking about the people that paved the way for us today to do the things that we do today, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, recognize that the context might be different for how we need to build the software, but the principles 
really remain the same, the same. And, and there's just so much to learn out there. So just be a student, look at other APIs, see what other people are doing. Um, you know, and, and just a, a gratuitous plug. I have a, a, a weekly newsletter I put out where I share a lot of those articles. So you can see what other people are doing. It's called API developer weekly. And uh, I just curate articles that are really interesting each week. That's a great place to start. Um, and then just be a student, learn, grow, get in there, dig in, think not just about the tech. If you're on the tech side, learn about some product. If you're on the product side, learn a little about tech, learn both sides of it and uh, you'll go really far. So great, such a great note and um, thank you. Um, and, and yes, subscribe to his newsletter. It's kind of been a mainstay of the space for a number of years. You're gonna learn and, and stay in tune with what's going on. Uh, thanks, James. I really appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, thanks, Ken. This has been great. It's always great to chat with you. Thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. All right, that was fun. Always enjoy talking to James. He's always a wealth of knowledge and experience, and I, I really like seeing his view of API operations and how he looks at things. It's a, it just really provides a much healthier and kind of more holistic uh, look at what how things are going on. So thanks, James, for joining us. I highly recommend that you head over and uh, look at his website. It's launchany.com, so L-A-U-N-C-H-A-N-Y.com. Uh, that's where you can tap into his uh, consulting services, and he can help you think about your, your enterprise API lifecycle. I also recommend you check out his newsletter because he's got API Developer Weekly, uh, which is at apideveloperweekly.com. And it is one of the top sources for, for news and information in the API space. I highly recommend you tuning in. So give you a little sneak peek into next week. Uh, coming up next week, we've got Lorinda Brandon from Better Cloud. So another friend of mine I've known for years, um, traveled around the world, had drinks with her in Europe, uh, all around the world. Uh, as we go, as we cruised around talking about APIs. So a wealth of knowledge when it comes to APIs, her experience at uh, SmartBear, Capital One, Twilio, and now she's at Better Cloud, which I think is really appropriate for this show because Better Cloud is a, is a SaaS management platform. So they're gonna help you better manage your SaaS service. And with the you know, growth of SaaS and, and what a big part it, uh, it is of the, the software development lifecycle in the overall tech sector, but the role it play, you know, APIs play when it comes to SaaS, I think is a pretty interesting area to explore. So look forward to Lorinda joining us next week. I'm gonna sit down with her for an hour and see what she's, she's learned so far. She's only been on the job for a few months, but I'm curious to learn, uh, you know, what 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 Better Cloud's up to, and and how she sees the API lifecycle there across her teams. Um, I've met quite a few of them. They're super interesting folks. Um, been having some great conversations around Open API and Open API driven lifecycle with her team, and I just look forward to to learning more. So tune in next week. You'll get uh, you know get to hear the get to hear what happened with Lorinda. And then uh, if you subscribe, you know, you'll keep being able to tune in and, and we'll keep uh, rolling out new shows. And we've got some other kind of new segments we're going to start rolling out as well uh, that dive into specific topics and areas. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll see you next week.